Who is ready to be in the house of the Lord and give him praise? Hallelujah. Who has the victory? Say Jesus. Say Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. All right, track. Jesus. Hallelujah. Put your hands together.
you, Jesus. i 
song with me hallelujah if you walked in sick you're gonna walk out healed Woo! if you walked in bound you're gonna walk out get ready that's just the mention of his name just the mention just the mention of oh. his name. Yeah, just the mention of his name everything can change if you walked in heavy if you walked in heavy you're gonna walk out Weary, you're gonna be alright. Just the mention of his own oh, Jesus.
Jesus. Oh, just worship, just adore him right now. your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names and be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone
Jesus. Ooh, hallelujah. Welcome to Revival Today Church. Give Jesus a great big hand clap in Fort Worth. Who came expecting to receive from the Lord today? Well, I stayed over with you. There's a change of venues. Looks like we're going to break a thousand people in Pittsburgh today. Yeah. Kofi just texted me. He said, one lady walked an hour in the rain, and he wrote, it's like Africa. He, and he's from Africa, so he, he's welcome to text that. God's moving. Amen. How many of you believe with me that America is not going to be left out of this last great move of God? I want to play you. Stay on your feet. I'm going to play you a couple of videos from what took place in the last week. And I want to read this. Acts 4. The Bible says, after Peter and John were beaten, they returned to their own company. And when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle, and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch forth your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and preached God's word with boldness. Amen. Boy, it's nice to be in Texas. Just the scripture with no commentary gets a applause. Acts 5, so, Acts 5, 12. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting re together regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as they went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Amen. You know, uh, I, God called me to be an evangelist, and we didn't start this church till less than two years ago, but almost everything in Christianity is geared to churches and church growth. So I would end up at stuff that talked about growing churches. And it was almost like, without it being said, they might have well said, since we're not going to have signs and wonders anymore, here's some ideas of how you can grow the church. But you find out that what God did in the book of Acts works now. Because somebody gets healed, and the next thing you know, they got four people with them the next week at church, because now it's real to them. So last week in Pittsburgh, you remember I came with my father, and we did Sunday night at 7 o'clock, but I was in Pittsburgh. And in the morning, I decided to be a good pastor and not shoot off to the back room and stick around and shake hands. And this lady came up to me crying. I was wondering whether somebody offended her or what happened. And she gave me, she couldn't barely get through the testimony without crying, then cried again when she gave it on video. And then we came down here Sunday night and heard what God did this week. So this is in the last uh, eight days. Revival Today Church, we got a campus in Pittsburgh that's meeting right now. And then uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, which is 9 Central, we're here. My wife's preaching in Pittsburgh. I'm preaching here today. I want you to see what Jesus did. And if you would, remain on your feet. And let's celebrate this testimony. Go ahead and roll it. Hi, everybody. I'm Janet Salak. I'm from four miles from the church. I live in Keys Rocks. Been a member of the church since the second day it opened. God You'll has be blessed how much me it is beyond belief. I came to know I have seen. Right after that, I went to my primary care physician for the last time. Start it over if you want. And he told me I had stage 3B chronic kidney disease. Hi, everybody. I'm Janet Salak. I'm from four miles from the church. I live in Keys Rocks. Been a member of the church since the second day it opened. 
God has blessed me beyond belief. I came to know I have seen. Right after that, I went to my primary care physician for the last time, and he told me I had stage 3B chronic kidney disease. And I just completely fell apart. I fell apart. I, I just, I was a mess, just a total mess. And then one day I just said, you know what, God, I can't do this anymore. It is up to you. I know you are the great physician and you will heal me. I know that. This past Thursday, I went to my new primary care physician. They were, she was going over my, my records and she said, honey, you do not have stage 3B kidney disease. Mm -hmm. Your creatinine is just a tiny bit elevated. And I screamed. Praise God, thank you, Jesus, and I am healed of the Lord. He has healed me again. I am just so happy and so overwhelmed with joy. And thank, I am just so grateful. And God did it again. Now, this coming Thursday, I go for my final blood test for that. And was, I know the report will be healed of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Praise the Lord. So then... Here is uh, Fort Worth. Roll the second one. Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm a member of Revival Today Church, and I wanted to share uh, a situation that just happened to me the day before yesterday. As pastor was walking down uh, the aisle, he uh, prayed with me, and um, I was uh, miraculously healed. Ten years ago, I had a stage four cancer, and I had to have chemotherapy and radiation. And that never does really leave your body. And I'd been uh, battling for the last 10 years with that to the point where I've lost so much weight, I can hardly eat food even. And um, pastor hadn't known any of this. And after ministering to me, I went home and I had such an appetite, I gained five pounds just shortly after I started eating, I couldn't quit eating. And hallelujah, I'm healed and healthy now. And give all the glory to God. Amen. You know, before you're seated, I mentioned this on Wednesday night that that dealt with two things. One, you had a woman that her kidneys are shutting down and God breathed life back into her kidneys. And then the second one, you have somebody that went through something and the cancer is gone, but then the damages from what happened in the past were still there. And God restored what was damaged from a past attack. So take the broader principle. Not only will God set you free from whatever you're going through, but even if you're carrying wounds from what's gone on before, and uh, I'm 43 years old, which isn't that old, but it's old enough to know when people go through things, there's uh, physicians and counselors that tell them, uh, you know, there's some things that you'll just never heal from and there's some things you'll carry the scars of that with you your whole life. That's true from a carnal standpoint. But one of the anointings Jesus had said was on him in Luke chapter 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, not just to open blind eyes, but to bind up the brokenhearted. So the things in life that destroy your heart, Jesus will heal you from the inside out. Can you say Amen. Well, if you're happy to be in church, give the Lord another hand clap. You can be seated. I want you, if you have your Bibles, to open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is the time where we were... Oh, hope whoever that is is okay. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Whoever has a purse with lead weights in it, God bless you. This is the time we receive the morning tithes and offerings, but I don't really feel like doing that right now. So I want to preach what God put on my heart for this morning and for this church that God called us to start. If you're new here, we're all new here. The first service was October 1st. 1 Samuel chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 12, Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork. While the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever 
it brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would even come before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. So they're messing around with the the money, the offering. The quickest judgments in the Bible all had to do with money. God doesn't like that. So you know, it's not a good idea when you're the pastor to go back to where they're counting the offering and just grab a handful of bills and take people out to lunch. It'll get you killed. Amen. Just wanted to start with an encouraging word on this Sunday morning. (laughs) But Samuel, though he was only a young boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year, his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one you gave to the Lord. And the Lord blessed Hannah. And she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old. And he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. So there's the the two. Anybody ever hear of Dr. Lester Summerall? He said there's basically only three areas you have to guard yourself in as a Christian and a minister. Don't touch God's gold. Don't touch God's girls. And don't touch God's glory. The three areas. Don't take credit for yourself. Uh, uh, receive praise like a cult leader. That's a bad idea. Didn't work out well for King Agrippa. And then you see the, how Eli's sons felt free to help themselves to the money, and then they helped themselves to the women. Because when you, when you get in the habit of taking what doesn't belong to you, it doesn't know any bounds. Can you say amen? amen. I want to tell you, since we're starting a new church, you can't control what happens. People are people. And people go through things. But as far as our staff and people that work at this church, there is a zero tolerance policy for any type of sexual misconduct. I fired about, uh, I've only fired about three people in 14 years. And one of them was since we started the church. He was on staff. He sent an inappropriate text message to another staff member. That happened on Saturday afternoon. I found out about it Saturday at 6 p.m. He was fired Saturday at 6.01 p.m. He was scheduled to dedicate his baby, and his family flew in on both sides to be at the dedication that Saturday. They said, well, can he come to the dedication since his family's here, and then we'll dismiss him Monday. I said, no, I don't ever want him on the property again. And they said, well, what about his family? He can tell his family why he's not welcome on the property again, because I'm not allowing that to mess up. How many, I mean, I won't even take a show of hands. I will not take a show of hands. Do not put your hand up. How many ministries have been blowing and going and lighting the world on fire, and then they get loose in that area? Now, I'm a preacher's son. My dad was here preaching last week. I've seen that. I've been around. I I used to sit when I was like 11 in church and listen to the dad preach. Then he'd have his son get up and do announcements or whatever, and I would lean over to my father and go, why is he terrible? What happened to you? Were you not in any of your dad's meetings? People are, 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 if they're not careful, they get around the anointing and they get familiar with it and lose respect for it. That can be something that you never allow happen to you in this last hour of time. This is going to be a church that values the presence and purity of God from now till when Jesus comes. Can you say amen? So say this so the devil can hear you. Say, I'm not Eli's sons. I'm Samuel. And notice how the Bible doesn't just go negative. It's showing you these losers. You know, it's probably not the best idea for me to preach at 9 in the morning because I don't get in a good mood till about 3 p.m. You're probably going to hear a lot of sermons on hell this early. There's a guy, I won't say where, but I, I, you know, the Bible shows you these patterns. They never stop happening. That's why I told you on uh, Thursday or Friday, that's why if you get around older preachers, if you're going through something as a pastor, they'll say, oh, he's doing that, do this, he'll react like that, then do this, and that'll take care of the problem. Because the devil has no new tricks. So the things you see here, they don't stop happening. The more you familiarize yourself with Scripture, 
It's like everybody just falls into patterns and you know exactly how to deal with people properly. That's why the Bible, the Bible says his word makes you wiser than your enemies. Can you say amen? Because God already has the book on the devil and the devil has no new tricks. So I used to preach for this guy. Uh, I won't say where. It's in a country that, uh, that rhymes with Banada. But I'm not going to tell you which one. So this guy built a great church in that nation. He is a great guy. And he had two sons on staff. I mean, it's literally like out of the Bible. Those sons were the biggest, there's no word I can call them in church. Everything they're saying here, steal the money, sue each other for money, all that kind of stuff, affair in the church. And when that, I didn't know that at first, but they bothered me. I'd preach, and I'm not like that. I like people. I don't look at people for the first time and not like them. And every time I walked by, I just could not stand them in my spirit. Then I find out why I can't stand them, all that stuff going on. And so the pastor invited me to preach. I said, I'm not coming. And uh, he said, why not? I said, you are a great man. I said, why you would want to repeat the story of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas is beyond me. I said, it has always astounded me because it's not like it happened to him. These guys build ministries 40 years, and their son flushes it down the toilet in two and a half years. And I'm not taking a show of hands, but some of you have seen that. Because they, they get around it, and they take the money for granted. It's not holy to them. The Bible says these things were wholly offered to God. And before the people could put them on the offer, offering, they'd take the offering, and then if the person had a problem with it, they'd assault them. So no, we're taking it. You're not offering it to God. At some point, if you're not careful, you forget that though we can't see him, we are here to worship God. Though this has to be run like a business, and there's business principles, this is not a business. This is a living organism called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that is charged to destroy the work of the devil in our generation. And God won't put up with that stuff. Say something with me. Say separation of tares and wheat. Now that refers to nations in the Bible, but you, you saw that during COVID. Basically, the COVID lockdowns exposed ministries that had roots that didn't go down deep and weren't built on the, on the Word and the Holy Spirit, and they wilted. And then the ones that aren't built that way are flourishing. Dr. Rodney Howard Brown was here this week. His ministry has probably tripled since COVID. People, I mean, you get arrested in Florida, every swamp redneck comes out to see who this pastor is that now has a criminal record like they do. Hopefully this won't be on the Internet. I don't need anybody waiting for me in Central Florida. That's what happened. So you're seeing that. There's a second wave of that happening right now, separation of tares and wheat. I would make it the number one, and I'm not saying this like verbal clickbait. If I were you, I would make it the number one thing in my life that every day when I lay my head to the pillow tonight, I do a self-evaluation. Am I growing closer to God or have I drifted further from the Lord? Can you say Amen. I'm not going the route Eli and Hophni and Phinehas do. I'm going Samuel's way. Now, Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the table, of the tabernacle. Eli said to them, I've been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things you're doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people aren't good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. I know that disagrees with your theology, so make sure to rip that page out of your Bible. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with his people. 27. One day a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. I revealed myself to your ancestors when they were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the priestly vest as he served me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to, your, to you priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? 
Yeah, the ministry is not a family heirloom to be passed down to the, to the, to the sons, whether, whether they're in sin or not. They should go get a job if they're living that way. Eli should have said, I heard what you're doing. Is it true? Then don't ever come back to this temple again. Because in not doing that, God said, why do you honor your sons more than you honor me? Say a statement so the devil can hear it and so your spirit can hear it. Say, I will honor God all the days of my life. And that's what you're doing. You know, you're not blowing smoke. It's 9 in the morning and you're in church, which means if you're a father, you had to be up at 820. If you're a mom, you had to be up at 430 to help get your husband ready for church. Where's my shirt? And so you're honoring God. Those, now I'll finish the scripture because God's going to say what I was getting ready to tell you. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I promised you that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priest. But I will honor those who honor me. But I will reject those who lightly esteem me. Now, if that sentence went just as strong both ways, it should read, I will honor those who honor me, and I will reject those who reject me. But it doesn't say that. I'll honor those who honor me, but I'll reject those that lightly esteem me. R.W. Schambach was an evangelist based in Tyler, Texas, and he used to shout in his tent all the time, Jesus will either be everything or he'll be nothing at all. Now, they, people think this is an old-time principle that doesn't work anymore, but ask Chick-fil-A what happens when you honor God. Did you know Chick-fil-A is now being closed on Sunday when every Christian is looking for Chick-fil-A? Anybody else beside me ever pulled in their parking lot on Sunday and went, man, there's nobody in line. Praise the Lord. Yeah. They are now average about $4.1 million per store. And the next closest, I believe, is McDonald's at $2.1 million a store. And the rest are at one something million a store. So they're about to be the highest revenue fast food chain, closed one day a week while the other ones are open seven. And they have no 24-hour stores. They all close at 10.30 because they're Christians. They go to bed. McDonald's, Burger King, all them open 24 hours, and they can't beat them. Then they give 10% away. And what happens? You go there, there's three lines of traffic and people waiting. And I don't know whether it's the anointing or what, but you could be 30th in line at Chick-fil-A and get your food instead of being second in line at another fast food chain, which I'm not going to mention because whatever one I pick, I get a message. Excuse me, I have shares in that. Can you please leave them alone? Can you say Amen. Say this out loud. If I honor God, he honors me. Say this with me. Say practical honor. So what do you do on, you know, God's not difficult to figure out. He's not like an unstable boyfriend or an unstable girlfriend that you, you can't figure out what they want. All God wants is honor. What are you, where are you right now? You're gathering to hear his word. When? On Thursday? No. On the first hours of a new week. He wants the firstborn. He wants the first of your livestock. He wants the first hours of your week. He wants the first of your increase financially. All he wants is for you to acknowledge that I've not forgotten that I was lost and bound in sin. And you, by the blood of your son, have made me everything I am. And today I am physically in your presence, returning praise and worship to you to let you know I have not become raised up in pride and think it's my own hand that's caused me to succeed. No, always remember it is the Lord your God that giveth thee power to create wealth. And I, I, I really don't want to get ahead of myself, but I have a hard time doing that because I already know what's in the notes. What did God say? He didn't just say, honor me or else. He said, if you honor me, I'll honor you. Hannah was not able to have any children. And finally, she has a son. And she has the novel idea. Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. What did God say? All right, thanks. Now you're back to childless. No. Now the childless woman went from not being able to have a child to five children, like an Irish Catholic woman. So no contraception joke. <laughs> Five children, as she gives the one to the Lord. Whatever you do for God, he gives back to you. Your time, 
your energy, your money, whatever. Whatever you make happen for God in his house, God makes happen for your house. Can you say amen? But no members of your family will ever live out their days. The few not cut off from serving at my altar will survive. But only so their eyes can go blind and their hearts break and their children will die a violent death. That's not a verse that's on a lot of Hallmark cards. And to prove what I have said will come true. I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family and they will be my priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all of your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give us jobs among the priests so we can have enough to eat. Now, when you read that story, you have a decision to make about which person you'd like to be. And if I were you, I'd make up my mind. I don't want to be the two sons that took God for granted. I want to be Samuel that honors God with everything that has to do with me. Can you say amen? amen? I want you, if you have your Bible, turn where I preached to you by the screen uh, two weeks ago, Luke chapter 21. I titled my message this morning, The Fire Must Never Go Out, Maintaining a Passion for God in the Last Days. The Fire Must Never Go Out, Maintaining a Passion for God in the Last Days. Luke chapter 21. Verse 29, Jesus gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things begin to happen, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth. This generation, what generation? The generation that sees the fig tree bud again. The generation that sees the rebirth of the nation of Israel will not pass from the scene until all these things are fulfilled. So when I say maintaining a passion for God in the last days, this is, we are in not the last days, we're in the final hour of the last days. You know, people say, I, you know, they say we're in the last days, but we're not. Okay, then you need to go back and correct Peter's sermon. Because on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 marked the beginning of the last days. Then Jesus said, know this, the generation that sees the fig tree bud again, they will still be here. When all these things take place, May 14th, 1948, when every one of these end time prophecies was impossible, there was no way to take a mark in your hand or in your forehead to buy or sell. All these things are here now, right in accordance with God's word. So knowing that you're living in the last hour of time, what's the most important focus? Luke 21, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Then what's the first thing Jesus says after that, 34, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled, D-U-L-L-E-D, by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap, for the day will come upon everybody living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Jesus basically gives the same discourse. Verse 42, so you too must keep watch. Matthew 24, 42, so you too must keep watch, for you don't know the day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility 
of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating other servants, partying and getting drunk? The master will return unannounced and unexpected and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him into a place with the hypocrites in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, right after that, just like Luke 21, what's the first thing Jesus goes into? Matthew 25, 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, who's the bridegroom in this story? Jesus. When Jesus waited in his coming. So why is Jesus waiting? To give people time to backslide? No. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. So he's giving more time for people to repent and be saved. But Jesus gave a warning. While he's waiting for people to get saved, there's going to come a tendency in the people that are already in relationship with God that as the bridegroom delayed his coming, they became drowsy and slept. Spiritual sleepiness. It's what opens the door to every demonic thing. The Bible says that an enemy came and planted tares among the wheat. While men slept, an enemy came and planted tares among the wheat. Stay alert. Be on guard. Don't allow your mind to be dulled by carousing and drinking and the cares of this life. At midnight, they became drowsy and slept. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our fire is going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't even know who you are. Now here it is personal to us. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour. When the Son of Man returns, I'm going to throw another scripture in. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read a lot of Bible today, so to make up for it, next week we'll just show movies. But I want to read some Bible today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is the Apostle Paul, the author of the Gospel of Grace, speaking. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one gets the prize. So run to win. Say with me, run to win. Texans have that in them. Run to win. Be the best. Have the nicest rims on your pickup truck. Even if you have to mortgage your house to do it. Everybody say, run to win. I hear, and I'm not trying. I've told you, I'll tell you a zillion times, just like I did in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, we have a billboard up, Revival Today Church, a home of signs and wonders. Not the home of signs and wonders. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the door to heaven. I told somebody in Pittsburgh, they said, I'd like to come to church. Are you going to be preaching there this Sunday? Because if so, I'll come. I said, if you only come to church when I'm preaching, you're going to go to hell. I did not die for your sins. Not only that, I'll take it a step further. I would have refused to die for your sins. I am a worker in the harvest field. I am not the door to heaven. You come to church because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think you get that. But I hear, I'm not saying this to make our church better than other churches. We're just starting. And there's many, many good churches. I'm going to go to one this week in Tampa. Many good churches. 
But I hear in my generation, I do not hear run to win preaching. I hear try and finish. Just make it across the line. That kind of mentality of trying to make it will likely end you in hell. People that are asking, how close can I get to the edge of the cliff without falling in? Fall in the cliff. I go to the Grand Canyon almost every year. There's always people falling in, trying to get close. Nobody falls in standing in Kansas. When you're always asking, what can I do and still go to heaven? How much sin can God forgive? You are on a path that leads to hell. But if you'll turn 180 degrees and say, how close can I get to the heart of God? How full can I get of the Holy Ghost and still stay on earth? You're on the path that the Bible commands you to be on. Somebody say, run to win. An old concept that I'm looking to marry into our modern world. Now that you're saved and born again, giving your everything for God, your whole self. Not, you know, the, the, the guys my age that preach, most of them, most, not many, most. You know, you, you don't need to do all that. You're not saved because it works. I'm not doing this this morning to get saved. He paid a debt he didn't owe. And now I owe out of love a debt to him and his kingdom that I'll exhaust myself to pay. I'm not trying to gain favor with God. That's what those guys don't understand. You know, you, you, know, you already have favor. You already, I know. I'm not doing this to try to buddy up to God. He already loves me. I'm doing it because he loves people. Just like when I find out something my wife likes, I get it for her. Because I love her. I'm not trying to save our marriage. Or save myself, I love her, so what she loves, I love. Only a moron of a husband would have their wife share something with them that they care about. And say, oh, that's your thing. I don't really care about that. that. That's the road to divorce. No, when you're in love, you find yourself getting in, making yourself be interested in things your wife likes. I've watched that show House Hunters with my wife. I don't know how many times. I sit there the whole time thinking, I don't care if these people sleep in the street. You know, we used to watch it. We had a 600-square-foot apartment in Bangor, Maine, 600 square feet, and I'm watching people look for a house. I think, I don't have a house. I'm living in an apartment. The apartment we lived in was an old folks' home that they had too many people die, so too many rooms came open. So they rented some of the rooms out as apartments. I was the youngest person in that building by probably 60 years. The lady that lived next door to us was a, (laughs) what a life. The lady that lived next to us was a nun her whole life who at 80 got upset at the Catholic Church and quit. At 80, you'd think you'd just ride it out (laughs) for three more summers or whatever. So she, (laughs) principled lady. So she's living next door to us at 85. It was a great neighbor because you could turn everything up as loud as you wanted. You, she can't hear a thing. <laughs> and then, and we were on the third floor in Bangor, Maine. So even though it was cold out, all those older people were on blood thinners and they had the heat cranked up. You could see the wavy lines of heat coming through the floor. We would have to crack our windows. It was like 17 degrees outside. We had to keep the windows open. So I'd come off the road, and that lady found out I was a preacher somehow. So she'd be waiting for me. She must have seen me out the window co- coming in. She'd be waiting for me. And, you know, because she was a nun, she cared about the work of the Lord. So she'd go, how, was your me- how were your meetings? I'd say, they were good. Where did you preach? And I'd tell her. What did you preach on? So I'd tell her, but she couldn't hear. I mean, she, she must have had 5 or 10% hearing. So I, I'd say, oh, I, I preached on 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. So he's giving more time for people to repent. What? I, said, I preached on 2 Peter chapter 3. You're going to have to speak up. I had to reap. I preached on 2 Peter ah, chapter 3. I'm like five feet from her. Giving myself abdominal tears. <laughs> recapping my message. Somebody say, run to win. Run to win. Oh, yeah. Give it your all. Amen. It's, it's kind of crazy that at Revival Today Church, in preaching from this standpoint, in Pittsburgh, we had more volunteers than members up until two months ago. 
We had about 120 people that were volunteers. We had 400 and some volunteers within six months at a brand new church. Everybody, And then some of the people would say, listen, th- you know, you, you're here about five days a week. Consider joining the church. Because we don't celebrate attendance, we preach. Making your life count for the work of the Lord. You know, if you're a greeter, it's not just the preacher. Do you know how many people are probably going to attend this church by the hundreds before it's all said and done? That the reason they came here is the other church that they went to, people were mean. When you're a greeter and the first face the people see is somebody friendly. Anybody ever watch our church in Pittsburgh, Revival Today Church Pittsburgh? You ever see that guy with the big mean face, Jeff? That's head of security. I mean, he's a professional killer. He does black ops. You know, we, didn't, we learned on the fly. We used to have security be cedars. But that was bad. For people's first experience coming to church, be Jeff. Can I help you? Uh, I was looking to sit down. Keep an eye on this guy. So we started to have nice ladies help seat people and security be security. Amen. So you greet children's workers. You know, I can, I can remember, I probably could list off eight specific children's workers I had as a kid that taught me the word. In fact, I went to go see one of them that was in, in their 80s. I said, you probably think I forgot about you. I said, I remember, I remember whole lessons you taught me and started to recap. They smiled so big. It, the church is not built on one man. Even Jesus said, this is too big a job for me. I'm going to go to heaven, pour out the Holy Spirit, and make a bunch of people carrying my spirit and my power to do a work for God. I want you to know at this church, you are part of a vision that is going to impact Texas and the United States and the world, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. If you believe that with me today, put those anointed hands together and give Jesus a mighty hand clap one more time. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say run to win. win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself, who's writing this? He wrote on grace. Everybody that preaches the grace message preaches it from Paul's writings. The same one, you can't just take one aspect of the Bible. You got to take the whole thing. You have to take the holiness part, the faith part, the signs and wonders, the salvation and evangelism part. And if you, if you won't leave any of the ingredients out, you bake a cake, you leave one thing out, you ruin it. But if you put all the ingredients in and don't pick your three or your favorite five, like a, like a Las Vegas buffet, take the whole thing, prayer, soul winning, the word, all down the line, then you have an explosion. Now you listen, and we're going to prove it here and we're proving it in Pittsburgh. There is no country and there is no culture that can withstand the force of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that is rooted in the book of Acts. Lest after preaching to others, I myself become a castaway. I'm preaching something to you today out of the Bible. I'm not bragging on my preaching. I'm bragging on the Bible. Number one, it's going to change your life. Number two, you're going to start to run strong. And number three, regardless of how you started life, you are going to finish strong in Jesus' mighty name. You listen to me. The devil might have written the first chapter of your life, but the devil's not going to write the last chapter of your life. You and Jesus are going to write a glorious chapter, and you're going to finish strong. And hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, and are now into the joy of the Lord. If you receive that one more time, take 15 good seconds in God's house. Clap your hands, all ye people. Turn to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. If you're a Bible scholar and you're here, 
You already know this. If you're not, you can believe me when I tell you I did not make this up in my house I'm staying in this morning. These are seven letters. You know, think of this with me. Yeah, I mean, no. The only sin that's not forgivable is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Yes, that was not written so then you could go out and stab people to death. Then as you're stabbing them, this sin's forgivable. <laughs> only Texans would laugh at an illustration that insane to give in church. You know what? I was unsure of this, Pastor, but I like him. No, it's, that's not why it's written. So Jesus, now think of this. If once you get saved, how many know Jesus died for all your past sins, present sins, and future sins? How many know, bro, there's nothing you can do? You can't earn your way into salvation. You can't sin your way out of salvation. Oh, yeah. Some of these guys on Christian television, and I'm not against TV preachers. I is a TV preacher. But some of these guys, I'd like to ask them. I've listened to you preach now for two hours. What does someone have to do to go to hell? Because all you do, now you think of this. If Jesus is trying to unrelax people, keep alert, not relax, keep alert. Don't be drowsy. Don't allow your mind to be dulled. The top neurosurgeon on planet Earth just started coming to our church, 83 years old. We started talking. He's a great man. I mean a great man. You know what he told me? Not as a Christian, as a neurosurgeon. He said the worst thing people can do is smoke marijuana. It messes up, he said, especially if you're a teenager, it messes up the neuroreceptors in your mind and causes you to become dull. Boy, that's hard to believe. As I repeat my Dunkin' Donuts order to the man for the fourth time. Bro, what was that order again? Coffee! Coffee. Just pour it in the cup and I'll take it from there. All right. You know, you'd almost think, why is it legalized now? You'd almost think there was a plan to turn everybody into a bunch of brain dead, dull zombies. That you, hey, you, hear, you hear what they're doing? Did you hear what they're playing? That's crazy, man. The simulation's crazy. Oh, yeah. That's what the world wants. The devil does not want you to be a sharp-minded, alert person. Because if you're sharp-minded, it'll lead you to Christ. There are people that have tried to disprove the Bible that ended up converting themselves. Because if you open your eyes, you can clearly see there is a devil, there is sin, but there is a miracle-working God who sent his son 2,000 years ago to conquer death so that you might live. You think it's hard to make money? If you're a young person here, if you just won't do drugs and stay off antidepressants and stuff, and if you're depressed, I'll pray for you. God will fill you with joy before lunchtime today. God will fill you with joy before lunchtime today. Full of joy. If you just pee a clean pee stream, you're going to end up as manager, district manager, regional manager. Talk to anybody that owns a company. They're losing employees left and right. Don't show up. Can't pass their drug test. Christians are set up right now. I'm telling you, wherever you're at in life right now, you should get happy because your worst days are behind you. If you will hook up today with the Word of God and with Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have the best two and a half months to close out a year that you've ever had in Jesus' name. Seven letters written to seven churches. Theologians will tell you that it represents the seven church ages. In other words, the first letter was the first church age under Rome. Then the second church period. And then seven is our period, the last letter. Five of those churches got an F. I mean, no matter what we do. Then how come Jesus wrote letters back and told them, if you don't knock off what you're doing, your lampstand will be removed from heaven. Five got an F, one got like a C, and one got an A. Listen to what he wrote. You'd think this was written last week. This is Jesus' message in Revelation to our church age, and it lines exactly up with all the other scriptures I read. Write this letter to the pastor of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness 
the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do. I mean, no, it's not about what we do. It's about what he's done. As far as your salvation goes, yes. Then after that, what you do becomes important because faith without works is dead, inoperative, utterly useless in the Amplified. I know all the things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. How could you better sum up our, our, our American Christianity? Not cold, not wicked, but not on fire. One hand on the cross, one hand on the world. Enough of the world so they're not hot, enough of the church so they're not cold. I know all the things you do that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that's been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich and buy white garments. Everybody shout purity. purity. Buy white garments from me so you will not be ashamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so that you can see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. There's that word again, dull, indifferent, not wicked. People aren't leaving, walking around Texas sacrificing goats to the devil. Witchcraft, yes, yeah, some. But the thing this church age battles, be careful that you're not dulled by carousing and drunkenness. Be diligent and turn from your indifference. Pastor Rodney, Rodney Howard Brown's coming. Let's see if I can make it. I was going to make it. Traffic was bad. That kind. And, and I'm just using that for example. I'm not trying to guilt you into coming to church events. But, you know, I told you I, I've attended and spoken, especially as an evangelist, I spoke with a ton of pastors. You know, well, once the building gets 65% full, people don't want to come anymore. And then if the parking lot's more than 70% full, people won't come because they want parking. Oh, is that true? So the one guy that was telling me that, then he was telling me if service goes past 8.15 for a 7 o'clock service, you lose people because people have short attention spans. He was telling me that at a restaurant. The Green Bay Packers, New England Patriots football game had been on in, in uh, Foxborough in Massachusetts. It was around this time of year or next month. When he was telling me that. So people can only sit still for 75 minutes, 80 minutes, and they need parking. And if the place is more than 65% full, they won't want to come. So I pointed at the TV. I said, now, the whole time we've been here, it's in quarter four. It's been four hours and 10 minutes. Why are people not racing for the exits? How come everybody's sitting there 65% full? People are sitting with somebody's belly spilled over into their seat. They have no room. And they pay, forget 70% full free parking. How much do you pay to go, to go watch the Cowboys if you park? 40 bucks. Boston would be what, 80? 80 in Boston. New York might be more. I bet you New York has $100 uh, uh, a car parking spots. And it's not by the stadium. So people, I said, explain to me then why if what you're saying is true, are these people from another planet or are they human beings? No, they're human beings. So tell me why. They can sit there for four hours and ten minutes in the rain. 37 degree rain. Outside, not move. Pay 80 bucks to park two miles away and walk with a big smile on their face and hand money. He said, you know, I never thought of that. Well, I have thought of it. Because that, why, why? The problem is not that people can't sit. You know, teenagers have short attention spans. Uh, I play a game called Modern Warfare on Xbox. I've played with the same 13-year-old on a Saturday from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. He never got up to eat or used the, I'm sure he must have peed himself or something. <laughs> Just guessing. Never moved. Why? Because he loves that game. I told that pastor, why can they sit there? Because they love football. They have created a church in America that is geared for people that don't love God. 
We're going to start our service. If you want to stand up and worship, you're welcome to. If not, you're welcome to sit and just enjoy your coffee. If I ever heard someone say that, I would projectile vomit on my own platform. (laughs) The Bible doesn't say if you feel like singing, sing. It says I'll enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I'll come into his courts with praise. I love coffee. We'll have coffee. I lo- but I'm not building a church on coffee and blue jeans. I'm building a house of people that know their God, that have been transformed by his fire and come to his house ready to give him honor. If you're that type of person, let Jesus hear your praise today. Somebody say, turn from your indifference. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts, the second chapter. Acts chapter 2. Well, just to show you what you're reading. Jesus rises from the dead. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Once when Jesus was eating with them, he commanded them. Everybody say commanded. Commanded. Not suggested. Commanded. Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water. But in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. What will happen when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit? And you will receive. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you and will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 2.1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Then it tells where all the people are from that were listening to the loud noise. Verse 13, but others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying they're just drunk, that's all. 14, then Peter, who? Stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd. How can that be the same Peter that denied Christ to one girl at a campfire? Peter, not baptized in the Holy Ghost, spineless, weak. Peter, baptized in the Holy Ghost unstoppable force. How do you tell a girl that's not even threatening you and doesn't even have the capacity to threaten you? I, know, I don't know, Jesus. And then in one more chapter after this, you're standing before <laughs> in the Middle East, same as it is now. I had, a, I had a guy in my ministry mentorship program. He said, I know you teach about church growth and stuff, but our ministry's in the Middle East. I said, yeah, so is the whole Bible. You know, he said, we're not allowed to start churches here. Neither were they. So you can't, you can't pick your own religion. You can't alter the Bible. He said, you know, we, we would be killed. I said, I'll tell you how things actually work. I said, if God sent you there, and I'm sure he did, you trying to fly under the radar will get you killed. But you being bold about what you're doing, I said, I'll tell you the kind of thing that will happen. Some kid will get delivered from heroin addiction, and it'll be the top sheik's son in that region. And when the sheik finds out about it, they'll make an exception just for you to have church and build you a building. It is time. Is time short? Is Israel surrounded by her enemies? Are all these prophecies being fulfilled before our eyes? Then the day of lukewarm, fly under the radar, close down for COVID, church is over. This is a new day, baby, for a church to get on fire with the Holy Ghost and win victory after victory for God. What happened to Peter? Nobody asked his opinion. He stepped forward and shouted to the crowd. Do you know how loud you have to talk when there's 3,000 men 
minimum, that are, that are mocking a crowd, and you silence them with no microphone or bullhorn? He wasn't sitting on a stool with a latte. Just share a couple thoughts with you about what's just taking place here. No, it's a little new to us. No, no, no. You men of Jerusalem. Read it right there in the New Living Translation. Listen to me. Some of you are saying these men are drunk, but they're not. Then he says people don't get drunk by 9 o'clock in the morning. Peter had never been to El Paso. <laughs> no, what you're seeing today was spoken. Now, I'm not going to preach this whole sermon, but Peter goes through and quotes verbatim one scripture after another scripture. Where did he, where were his notes? Where did he get time to learn? Does he have memory verse flashcards? No. And I think of this. If you think you're a big failure or something, you, you have like a low self-esteem. If you have low self-esteem, read Peter in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He, he said one intelligent thing in four books. True. I'm not picking on him. And the one time he did say something smart, he said to uh, Jesus said, who, who do men say that I am? They said, who do men say that you are? Who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, my father must have told you that. There's no way you got that for yourself. I've been with you for four books. You're not smart enough to say anything like that. So how do you go from professional screw-up that's getting rebuked by Jesus, Satan, get thee behind me, to standing forward and rattling off one scripture after scripture, Scripture. I bet you the other disciples were standing there thinking, who is this guy? And I bet you, because I've been in that situation myself, I bet you about halfway through that message, Peter was listening to this thing come out of his spirit and saying, who is this talking? I'm telling you, this thing that Jesus said is the secret of the church. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire will turn you into another woman. It will turn you into another man. It will burn up all your weakness and inferiority and dumbness and mistake. And it will put in you a fire that the world can never take out. You're going to leave this place today with a visible fire that's on your life in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say it out loud. The fire must never go out. One more time. The fire must never go out. Peter goes from speaking that, those people mocking him. Peter's words pierced their hearts. Acts 2.37. And they said to, them, to him and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This promise is to us first 12 apostles, and that's it. This promise is to you, to your children, even to those that are far off, even as many as have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. Strongly urging his listeners, save yourselves from this generation that has gone astray. Save yourself from this generation that has gone astray. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. The fire must never go out. Maintaining a passion for God in the last days. Number one. The problem the Bible says, the chief problem you'll face is that before he comes back, that day of the Antichrist will not first come until there is a great falling away. And many shall depart from the faith. I used to think when I was younger that that meant that sinners were going to get more wicked. Though they, they will, but that's not what that's talking about. To depart from DFW airport, where do I have to have been at least once? That's right. So it's people that were in the faith. I mean, you just had a pastor in, in Dallas had to shut down his church this year. Went on a pro-LGBT marriage rant in public. I actually, I played it for my nephew driving over here. I said, it encouraged me. Nobody clapped. It was almost all young people. 
And 400 of the 700 just turned around and walked out. So when they said, oh, we're all back, no, everybody's not backslidden. I'm not in a room full of backslidden people. I'm in a room full of people that are on fire, that are going to get more on fire, and are going to do great things for God. The problem, the Bible says, is that's what you'll face. An indifference. A spiritual deadness. Satan doesn't have to get you to sacrifice a goat to him out in the woods for you to go to hell. He just has to get you to, nah, I used to do that. You know, I used to think you had to pray an hour. I used to think you had to read the Bible every day. I used to think church was important. Now I realize I'm the church. Church is in your heart. I have a little heart parsonage with a heart pastor. When you hear, start hearing that kind of talk, you're not listening to somebody that's on fire. You're listening to somebody that's drifting. I prophesy in the name of Jesus. You will never drift again in Jesus' name. God did not bring you here today to frustrate you. He brought you here to burn out whatever you picked up from this culture that has deadened your fire. That fire is getting relit today, and that fire will never go out. If you believe it, shout amen like thunder. The problem. Number two, what does a passion for God look like? If passion's the thing they're going to come against, then passion should be the thing that you work to stoke. What does passion in the Bible look like? Nehemiah chapter 1. The Bible says, Nehemiah heard how his homeland Jerusalem had been torn down, and he was the king's servant, and the king had never seen him. This is Nehemiah chapter 1 through the beginning of chapter 2. Nehemiah had never or, or the king had never seen Nehemiah look sad. He said, Nehemiah, what's wrong? I've never seen you look sad before. You know what Nehemiah said? If you appear sad before the king, they cut your head off. If, let alone speak disrespectfully. Why are you sad? Why am I sad? You tore down my home city, and now it lies in, rubbles in, the pe- in rubble, and the people there are struggling. You ask me why? That's why. He did it. So what's the next response? And the king said, cut off his head. Oh, no. Passion for God is a a main ingredient to successful Christianity. It's not a Pentecostal thing. Good luck finding a Pentecostal that preached harder than Billy Graham in 1955. They weren't coming to see a guy sitting on a stool sharing some thoughts. He would lose 15 to 20 pounds during a crusade. Pumping his fist, packing Yankee Stadium out, telling people about Jesus with passion. What about before him, Billy Sunday? Anybody heard of the evangelist Billy Sunday? <laughs> um, what president was it? Harrison. Rutherford, no, Rutherford B. Hayes, I think it was. Came to see Billy Sunday preach, and they said, what did you think? He said, I've never seen a preacher preach as if he was fighting off a swarm of bees. Oh, yeah. And they amended the Constitution at the end of his ministry to outlaw alcohol. He stood in Chicago one day and said, I prophesy in the 1910s, I prophesy that the day will come where the alcohol that's in these bars will run down the streets of Chicago. People laugh, oh, this guy's getting a little carried away. And then they passed prohibition, and the agents came and busted it all out and poured it down the street, the exact street that he pointed at. You know why? Because his home had been broken by alcohol. And when he got saved, he went to war against that devil. I'm going to tell you something right now. When you get on fire, number one, the devil's going to have a problem on his hand. Because all the things that you've gone through in life, the purpose of them was for the devil to beat you down, give you one stomach punch after another, so that you never rise up and never cause a problem. But when you get on fire, you start going to war against the things that went to war against you. Not only do you make it out, but God uses you to set many captives free. I'm telling you, there are people here. Before you go to heaven, there will be thousands of people that are set free because of your testimony and your passion in Jesus' name. You ask me why I'm sad? You destroyed my city. Okay. What do you want from me? He said, I want to rebuild it. Give this man whatever he wants. And give him enough to build a house for himself while he's at it. You never make anything happen for God and him not make something happen for you. Can you say amen? Amen. 
What about David? Psalm 69.9. The zeal for your house. Everybody say zeal for his house. Zeal for your house has consumed me. When they insult you, it's like they're insulting me. Goliath never said one thing about David. He was mocking God. David walked in and said, you know, there's a video I have on my phone. A lady gets assaulted uh, physically on, on the sidewalk, and her boyfriend just stands back up against the wall. Yeah, you know, I know it didn't take place in Texas, or that girl's dad would have came and done worse to him than the people did to the woman. There's a lot of people, oh, it's not, not my battle. David said, this isn't my battle, but if you, if you go against my God, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he would defy the armies of the Lord. Today, I'm going to cut off your head. And this 17-year-old, 17 with no training, I'm going to take this guy out. Then when I'm done with you, I'm coming after every man behind you. Uh, the only battle David had to fight was not Goliath. That thing was over in five seconds. It was with lukewarm Israelites that should have been doing what David did, but not only did they not do it, they tried to talk him out of it. Now, I'm going to tell you a litmus test right now. You'll know when you're starting to get on fire for God. When other Christians begin to pull you aside and tell you to take it easy. When other Christians talk to you about their concern, about how much you're going to church, and how much you're giving in the offering. If you would have saved all that tithe money, you'd have had a car by now. When you start having interventions from people, that were happy to watch yourself drink yourself blackout drunk and never say one word. But now they see you get hands laid on you and flow in the Holy Ghost and they get concerned. You should get happy. When you're starting to ruffle the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that's a sign that the fire is coming alive in you. And that's exactly what you're going to face. Not demons, not witches, religion. Jesus was not put on the cross by a, co a, a consortium of hookers and drug dealers. Pharisees and Sadducees. That when they see you get on fire, who's the first person Peter got called into a meeting with? Jihadist Muslims? No. The council of the temple and leading priests. Hey, take it easy. Quit praying for the sick. Quit preaching the way that you're preaching. If you're going to be on fire in America, you're going to have to make up your mind at an altar today. I'm going to get on fire. I'm not going to allow American religion to tell me I've gone too far. I'm going to get more on fire in Jesus' mighty name. Say it out loud. The fire must never go out. Oh, yeah. And what, what happened with David? We were still talking about him today, aren't we? Name me another Israelite soldier. Name me a Pharisee. Name me a Sadducee. No one cares. Their lives don't matter. What happened in Acts chapter 2 when they began to speak in tongues? When they got on fire for God, the crowd began to mock them. The devil can't stop the power of God. He can only attempt to get you to be ashamed of it. But I'm not ashamed. If every sinner and pervert feels free to march down the street and parade their iniquity, why would I be ashamed of righteousness? Why would I be ashamed of the power of God? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it alone is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Nehemiah, David. No regard for personal consequence. Somebody say passion. passion. You want to see passion? Look at my 60, uh, at the time, 62-year-old father preaching in New York in 2020 when it was illegal to have church of any kind by order of the governor. And so this is, this is not young. This is not youthful zeal. Shambach had it at 81. Preached for two hours. I took my nephew. How old were you then? 10? I took him to Providence. Brother, I didn't think there would be too many more meetings left. 1,100 people, floor and balcony, preach for two hours and then lay hands on everybody in the building for an hour and ten minutes. Don't tell me passion's a function of youth. You can be young and weak and dead. 
And you can be 85 and be on fire. This church is going to have young people that are on fire. Moms and dads that are on fire. Older people that are on fire. This is my dad. I'm not playing because it's my dad. I'm showing you what passion looks like. When churches are shut down, he's not preaching in Texas or Florida, New York. And he's preaching a regular message. But then you could just tell. He could feel the demonic resistance of that place. This is what passion looks like. Play it. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. But he will keep you safe. Praise God. That is the promise of God. I'm not afraid of anything in this world. I'm certainly not afraid of some damn flu. And I use that word biblically. I am not going to stop the work of the Lord for some bacteria or virus. I'm not going to be an idiot. I'm going to be courteous. I'm going to do my best to be gracious. But I am not going to stop building the church for some demonic virus or some demonic mandate. I am on a mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that too honest, Pastor? Jesus said, I'll build my church. That's my mandate. I'm not playing games. Many of you that know my ministry know that nobody's going to stop me if it means I have to go to prison, I'll go to prison. If it means they put me on a firing squad, I'll be on a firing squad preaching to the last person loading their weapon. I am on a holy mission, and holy men don't take orders from unholy men. Holy Ghost fire. Say this with me. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. See, I grew up around people that were filled with the Holy Ghost, but they, had, they didn't have enough fire to singe notebook paper. You speak in tongues when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, but that's not the end of it. What you, so that's why I'm showing you that video. That's fire. That's fire in your eyes. That's the kind of thing that if Governor Cuomo was in the seat, he'd have backed off. When you carry that, people back up. There's something in your eyes where people know you're not messing around. This is not a 501c3 religious charity. This is a living organism called the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're on a mission, and what God has begun, nobody can stamp out. Hallelujah. Say with me, the reward of passion. Number one, understand no one pursues God at a loss. No man pursues God at a loss. I said, so Father, the Lord, we gave up everything. We don't have anything. Bull crap. Sorry, I forgot. It's early. Horse crap. I listen to those kind of testimonies growing up. I don't believe you. I don't find anybody in the Bible that gave up everything for God and got nothing. It's, it, you're actually lying about the laws of the Spirit. Give, and your gift will come back to you. No, God never asked people, what did Hannah get? She gave a son and got five more kids. Nobody pursues God at a loss. Right. Those that honor me, I will honor you. Let me tell you something. When God honors you, you will know that you've been honored. I forbid. What did we do for pastoral appreciation in October for our pastors? Nothing. I refuse to have it. I'm not receiving an ice cream cake as my reward for my services. I would rather it be kept, and I'm not against if pastors want to have pastor knock yourself out. I don't want it because I've learned something. If I take, if I make a reward for myself, that's what I get. But if I, if I don't and I let God reward me, God would reward me with things that I wouldn't even steal if I was a wicked person. Those that honor me. See, I've dealt with the negative part for an hour and ten minutes. Let's hit the positive. Those that lately esteem me, I'll reject. But those who honor me. I will honor them. When Billy Graham died, did he ever seek out honor? Never. When he died, they drove his body down Billy Graham Parkway in North Carolina. 
with lines of people down both sides holding up signs for his home going. One of two citizens to ever be interred at the National Rotunda in Washington, D.C. And whether they liked it or not, every demonic news agency had to take time and say, Evangelist Billy Graham passed away today at age 99 and play clips of his preaching. Because when you honor God, I'm telling you, the harder you pursue after God, the harder the blessings of God pursue after you. The harder you pursue after God, the harder his blessings come after you. Nobody pursues God at a loss. I have more money than all my friends whose parents pulled them out of revival meetings because they had finals in the morning. Every last one of them. I pulled up to the Pittsburgh private airport. They said, nobody, use, we wanted to thank you because no one uses this airport more than you. I said, seriously? They said, maybe Ben Roethlisberger, but I think it's you. I never tried to do that. I just need a plane. If I never, if you think I have a goal to get a jet? If I was making my own goals, my goals would be to never step on a plane or leave my living room again. <laughs> what I'm doing, you can't pastor a church in Pittsburgh and another one in Fort Worth on a Huffy 12 speed. <laughs> what offering has ever been taken for a plane? It was just delivered. Delivered! I have a plane for you, Reverend. Then the people at the airport tell me they're going to sell me fuel. I'm not allowed to tell you what they're selling me for. So, so cheap it's going to save me like 300000 a year from what I was paying on charter flights. The hard, I never tried for any of that. Never tried. Never had a thought for it one time. I used to have to go on name your own price to get a coach ticket. Those days are over because the harder you go after God, the harder his blessings go after you. Let me say something while my blood pressure's up. Because I know there's people that don't agree with that. I was, sitting, I was sitting in a meeting with a bunch of ministers. And this guy, I'll tell you, when people talk like this, it makes, me, it makes me angry, like David angry. Because somebody was saying how he kept his church open during COVID. And he said, me and the, my two friends that kept our churches open, we got sued. But he said, our churches are all triple in attendance now, and our money has gone up triple. And this guy said, but we need to also remember that that's not the story for everyone. No, there's a script. First of all, as soon as he said that, I felt Adonis' masterpiece art Puerto Rican nails digging into my thigh underneath the table. Take it easy. Because I think I put my fork and knife down and then picked up the steak knife by the handle holding it down. I was going to reenact the final scene of Rambo 2, pin the guy to the table by his tie. We also need to remember that not everyone receives their reward in this life. First of all, Jesus said they do. I'm not talking to get mad at sinners, when they, but you're, you're a minister. Not everybody gets their reward here. Jesus said, anyone that gives up family or house or possession or property will receive now and in this life 100-fold what they gave up and will receive a reward in the life to come. You have people say, people are dumb enough to say, I've never had that happen. Are you dead? If so, notify somebody. If you're alive, that means life's not over. So you should have an expectation that there is a harvest with my name on it. I tell you as your pastor, get ready. The last two and a half months of this year, there is a harvest with your name on it. We have to remember that not everyone receives the reward here. I thought, buddy, we're sitting in a private club eating free food, filet mignon, like a nice club we were all invited to. If ISIS busted through the door and decapitated every one of us, we're, we're living blessed. It's not that people don't have blessing. It's that they lost gratitude. It's people with no shoes. Do you know the average person on planet Earth still drives an ox cart? Not a car, an ox cart. I don't really have anything. If you're the poorest person in Texas, you have more than most people in the world. You have no gratitude. That's what you don't have. So I, I, now I'm going to tell you, I'm not trying to make myself better than other people. I'm just that way naturally. No, I'm not trying to make myself better than other people. But I, I will tell you, I have not lost gratitude. That's why that was the first thing I thought of. I thought, we're eating steak. I didn't pay for this steak. 
Somebody invited me here to a club that you're not even allowed to be a member of. They, don't, they have to invite you to be a member. It's a club of people that are net worth are nine and ten figures in northern New Jersey. And I'm there eating. We're in this room with mar- marble everywhere. And you got the nerve to say we don't all get a ro-. You have lost sight of how good God has been to you. That's why you don't have to. I don't have to know who's speaking on Sunday to go to church. And I don't need a 30-minute offering cheerleaded out of me. I was a crooked-footed, speech-impaired boy when God called me to preach. And the Lord has taken me higher than I ever thought possible in a short amount of time. I owe God everything, and I make a decision. I give you my everything. Nobody pursues God at a loss. Enemies to passion. Sin. Make sure you're not dulled by carousing and drunkenness. The sin of this world. Sin is an enemy to passion. Sin brings a spiritual laziness. It starts going to war against your fire. Lift both hands all over this room. I I, I know this isn't like a Sunday morning type message, but I didn't stay over apart from my wife and daughter to give you three points that I preached at the last place last week. I came, the Lord told me to start a church here, and I'm going to put something in the spirits of people here that is going to make the devil sorry that he ever stepped foot in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Every sin that has so easily beset you before today, Be free from it in Jesus' name now. From this day forward, you'll walk in purity in every area of your life in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. Enemies to passion, sin. Number two, prayerlessness. Prayerlessness breeds spiritual dullness. Pray always in the Holy Ghost, building up your most holy faith. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks mysteries unto man, but speaks directly to the Lord and builds himself up. Prayerlessness breeds spiritual laziness. Prayerfulness is a pathway to spiritual passion. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost before, receive today. It's free. I'm going to lay hands on everybody in the building that wants hands laid on them. When I do, you'll begin to speak in tongues. How? Out of your mouth. It'll bubble up from your spirit, and you'll speak it out of your mouth. And now you have when you don't know what to pray, because you don't know what to pray. When you don't have the words to say, there is now another language coming up from the inside that as you're praying it, it stirs that fire up. If you can testify to that, can you say amen? Amen. Number three, enemies to passion. Bad company. Backslidden. I'm not talking about... Somebody has to take their medication. (laughs) Bad company. I'm not talking about sinners. I'm talking about lukewarm Christians. I'm not trying to get anybody to switch churches to my church. We know how to win souls at this church. That's what we've done in Pittsburgh. But I will tell you, if you grew up in the fire of the Holy Ghost, and you have your kids in some church that doesn't believe in the anointing, nobody speaks in tongues, they've never seen anybody get healed, you're going to send them away to a college, and in one semester, one humanitarian's professor is going to have them come back with a hatred for God. Because they grew up in your faith, but they never had an encounter with God. You cannot stay on fire for God surrounded by lukewarm people. Before David took Goliath out, he had to break company from Eliab. Here are you. He says, you're just a shepherd. You should be watching those sheep. You're going to have people trying to talk you out of it. You have an acceptable level of Christianity. Acceptable level of church attendance. Acceptable level of giving. But you've got to make up your mind. Do I want American Christianity or do I want Book of Acts Christianity? I've only been at this church for, this is what, Sunday number four? I have nobody in mind. I don't know. Mm, I might know nine people here, 12 people. Even like, like, like I, know, um, I know you. I, know you're not, I, don't know, I don't know if you're married. I don't know if you have kids. So I don't have, I'm saying this because I don't have anybody in mind when I say this. I don't follow you on Instagram. In 2023, and if Jesus there is 2024, if you make a choice, to have your kids grow up outside of the presence of God. You are making a fatal mistake. And they can get straight A's. They can get into a good college on scholarship. But you will have failed as a parent. 
Because what good is a master's in business from TCU if it comes with a cocaine addiction? What good is a doctorate from Texas A&M if you have crippling depression so bad you can't get out of bed in the morning? What profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? Is there anything more valuable than a man's soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. You need to break ranks from Texas and American culture that teaches to put everything else first. You know, we're breaking 1,000 people today in Pittsburgh. It's a wonder we have nine people, let alone 1,000. You know what I told a family? Their kids never in youth group, ever. And then they tell, you know, they're having this problem, this problem. But they're never in youth group. They have little league. I said, have their little league coach pray for them. I'm not praying for them. Go there. That's where your money goes. That's who, who runs your family. So go have your football coach pray for your son when, when he's in trouble. I'm not saying you can't play football. I played football. I said, boy, you don't look like a football player. You'd be amazed how fast I can run when big people are trying to hurt me. <laughs> I broke a 61-yard runoff in high school, and you could hear me screaming in the press box. <laughs> I ran on straight fear. I played ice hockey in Maine all four years. I'm not saying your kids can't have a life. But I'm saying anytime there's a conflict between God and life, and you teach them to choose life, I have to work. You, is that what we're going to do? Are we going to raise another generation of worthless Christians? Pastor, i got to work. I just got a promotion for 12000 more a year, but i got to work Sunday. So. And Pastor Pat, I'm like, no, I understand. Let me tell you something. I'm not telling you this is some kind of socialist loser. I'm not on government assistance. I have plenty of money. I have a necktie. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you, put, if you will teach your children to put God first. You know what my dad would have me tell my boss? Tell your boss you're a full-time Christian and a part-time employee. Oh, yeah. Sundays, we're in church. We are like, now you watch. You watch these militant insane people called Hamas that out of devotion to their religion and their God don't care what the media portrays them as they are on a mission and that's wicked but we have a holy thing we're not doing what we're doing by blowing up buildings we wrestle not against flesh and blood if there's any people that should know the, co the concept of sacrifice and devotion and putting their God first it shouldn't be wicked people in the Middle East it should be believers in Jesus Christ that God is their everything come on if that sounds like you one more time today clap your hands unto the Lord What is, now that I've preached that you need passion, how do you keep it? What's the secret to passion? Number one, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and praying in the Spirit continually. Number two, fasting and prayer. January 2nd through January 22nd, every year this church get, engages in fasting and prayer. How many of you have done the 21-day fast with us before? We broke the fast January 22nd this year. January 23rd, I got a call from people that turned down $4 million from Marriott to give us 24.8 acres of land on Interstate uh, three, uh, 279 in Pittsburgh, and it's already zoned to be a church. You'd be amazed what happens when you honor God. Don't have to go to a bank. Didn't have to sit in a cubicle and say, can you please loan me some money to do the work of the Lord? No, no, no. Put God first, and you'll never have to reach out to If you put God in his proper place, no man will ever have to help you. You will be a help to mankind, but mankind, you will not require their assistance. That's where you're going to go. I'm telling you where you're going. You are going to a high place in God from today. Number three, how do you maintain your fire? Giving. What does that have to do with anything? Where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. Of all the churches that shut down for COVID, I would like to know the percentage of the senior pastors who tithe. And I bet you every church that stayed open, the pastor was a tither. Because you can't, you cannot get me to shut, like you heard my dad talking. My dad's, a t where you're giving is, anybody that leaves a church, talk to any pastor, their giving stops six months before they leave. You check out with your money before you check out. A wife stopped getting presents from her husband long before the divorce. When your money checks out, where a man's treasure is, there's heart. When your heart's not there, your money's not there. 
on the flip side, what you tie your money into. Anybody ever invest in stocks and you didn't even ever, never heard of the company you invested in? Then after you put the money in, you start seeing it everywhere? Because your money's in it. Money ties your heart into the thing. So when you give God high-level honor in your giving, it ties your heart into God's kingdom. When I get Jesse Duplantis's magazine or Rodney Howard Brown's magazine, I, know, I have money in that. I have high-level finances in that. I want to see what you're doing. I want to see about your plane. I'm happy you're taking the gospel around. This is not somebody else's thing to me. This is my thing. Can you say amen? How do you stoke passion? If Jesus said that we're to be on guard for these things in the last days, what do you do? Patterning your life after those who are on fire. It's not enough just to break company from those that aren't on fire. You have to get involved with people that carry the fire of God. I'll be at our, uh, Rodney Howard Brown's ministers meeting Tuesday through Friday this next week. I have the most money I've ever had in the bank. i got plenty of places to preach. I'm an evangelist. I have two, two churches. I've got every Sunday booked if no one ever calls again. But I refuse to get complacent and to go to meetings that have miracles when I need a miracle. Why not just stay in the flow? Can you say amen? And finally... How do you receive the fire? I'll close with one last scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 1. What do you do to stay in passion for God? Practically. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Anybody blessed today? Anybody glad you came to church today? Second Timothy 1, verse 5. Paul said to his son in the faith, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I know no one cares to talk about this kind of stuff. Everybody likes talking about generational curses. But you know you can pass down a blessing? Do you know the same way your parents might have taught you? Alcoholism or anger problems, you don't have to pass that down. Timothy, I thank God that the same unfeigned faith that was in your mother, grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice is now in you. You see, my dad up there preaching, and now I make a little more sense to you. I caught what he has. He didn't have that in the pulpit. He had that all the time. You can pass the fire down. You can teach your children to be on fire for God. Brother Jonathan, I'm just believing for speaking opportunities. Start with a family altar. Prepare a short message for your children before bed, even if they're 16. Share something with them out of the word of the Lord. Pray for your children. Take care of your house. You can't see the reason you have so many depressed and discouraged Christians. They, we got to change America. Start with your house. All America is is a collection of families. You're not responsible for all 50 states or even the state of Texas. Take care of you. <laughs> As for me, that's what jo Joshua was no lightweight. He said, y'all can do whatever you want. You want to serve the gods that are here? Knock yourself out. But as for me and my house, not we're going to try to start serving the Lord better. We will serve the Lord. If you agree to that today, can you let your amen be the loudest? Amen. The same faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice is now in you. That is why I remind you, fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. When? When I laid my hands on you. The laying on of hands is a conduit for the grace of God that's in one vessel to flow freely into another vessel. And you don't pay for it. For everybody that paid $100 for your ticket, I'm going to pray for you. You're in Simon the Sorcerer territory. Let your money perish with you for thinking the gifts of God can be bought with money. The price that you pay to receive from the laying on of hands is spiritual hunger. Blessed are they that are hungry. And they tell me that in the original Aramaic, it's a starvation hunger. I must have. 
I don't want what the world has. I want what Jesus has. And then God takes the grace that he's put into one vessel and through the laying on of hands, according here. Now I remind you, stir up the gift that came on the inside of you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power. Everybody say power. power. That's what you heard my dad demonstrating for you. That's power. That's not, you know, no need to make any threats. I'm telling you, if the police were there, they'd have sat down and listened to the rest of the message and left them alone. Power. Jesus walked through them and no one dared lay a hand on them. Well, they killed Jesus. No, he didn't. He laid down his life. Pilate said, are you going to remain quiet before me? Don't you realize I have the power to take your life or set you free? That's the only time Jesus spoke up. Make no mistake about it, my friend. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. I'd blow you out that back wall if I wanted to. Somebody say power. Power. Power to live right. Power that when all your friends at the oil field or wherever you work, the factory, Verizon, wherever, are all going so, oh, come on. You're on a sales trip. Oh, they would drink. You know, that's where we network. No. I love you. See you in the morning. Oh, come on. What are you, a nun? No, I'm not, but close. <laughs> and feel no shame. Why let people that should be ashamed feel pride? And you that should feel an honor for what you're doing, feel ashamed. Who cares? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing I'll impart to you today that I am the master of, is the spirit of who cares. <laughs> I told our insurance company that during COVID. If you continue to keep your ministry open, we'll have to drop you as a client. Who cares? They don't know what to do with people like that. I don't care about you. The only reason I need insurance is because of the blessing of God that produced all this stuff. I, I'll lose you any day, but I will not lose the blessing. Can you say amen? You want to threaten me? We might have to drop you. Okay, limu emu. I'm going to take orders in the ministry from the Geico duck. I have the wrong two companies, but you got the point. Amen. <laughs> Let me give you another, another little life lesson while I'm with you for a couple more minutes. Anytime the devil threatens you, call his bluff. If you miss for church, we'll have to fire you. Make them do it. Did you know it's illegal to fire somebody for going to church on Sunday morning? You cannot make a Muslim work on Friday. You cannot make a Jew work on Saturday. You cannot make a Christian work. And it's not even all day Sunday. Sunday morning for two hours. My Patrick Franz that was down here that runs the accounting for our ministry, he had a degree in accounting. He was working a job for $11 an hour in the oil field back in the early 2000s. He came to one of my revival meetings and heard me preach like this, that if you're missing church on Sunday morning for your job, you got some questions to answer if you call yourself a, quick, a Christian. I said, you don't even have to. Just tell your boss, I'm leaving at 8 a.m. I'll be back at noon. I just, I, I need to give worship to, to God. And I said, just put up with the consequences. And so they knew they couldn't fire him, so they treated him bad. They gave him more work. But what ended up happening? I saw him not knowing any of that and felt in my spirit to hire him. I hired him. He's now making more, probably double what his supervisor that gave him a hard time for going to church made. Whatever, listen now. Whatever fiery furnace or lion's den you're faced with up front, put up with it. It's only temporary. It's the devil's threatening to, because if you don't back up, the devil doesn't have power to back you up. So he threatens and intimidates, hoping that you'll sit down like everybody else does. But today, we've got a room full of people that are going to stand up and be counted and say, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to be who God's called me to be. Stand on your feet, bow your head, and close your eyes. If you're here today, and you're honest with God and honest with me, honest with yourself, Jonathan, I've allowed the deadness, the spiritual deadness of North America to corrupt my Christianity. Think of this now. Dr. Willard Cantillon said, 
if we take that parable literally, that five let their fire go out and five kept their fire lit, then that would mean 50% of the church is not going to be ready when the trumpet sounds. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say nine were wise and one was foolish. He said five were wise and five were foolish. Five took extra oil, but the other five didn't have enough oil and the fire went out. What about you? Can you say with a pure heart to Jesus, Jesus, I've honored your command in Revelation 3. I'm living with you first in every area of my life. Or if you were honest, the Bible says in Song of Solomon, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Some of you might just have one area that you've never got under the blood, and the devil uses that area. Anger, lust, unforgiveness. And maybe you even have rightful unforgiveness. I've had some people, you know, I've only been pastoring for less than two years, but I've had people share things with me. The reason I have trouble forgiving is this person did this to me. And you think, yeah, I would have trouble forgiving them too. But God will give you a grace to forgive them like he forgave you. Not condoning what they did, but you're allowing it to not have a hold on you anymore. Bitterness, unforgiveness, lust, greed, fornication. If those warnings, and I didn't read all those scriptures because I felt like I needed to fill more time. If those scriptures are laced in with the end times, that while you're waiting for Christ to come, make sure your garments are white. Then obviously in our generation, there's a massive problem with that. Now think of this. I'm not trying to be morbid or sad. One of the churches I preached in recently is under new leadership. The pastor of that church, it had 3,000 people, good preacher, great preacher, they found him Sunday night over, overdosed in a Manhattan hotel room. He preached Sunday morning in another state. So he already had plans, preaching Sunday, to be in another state to go party. And had been doing that for a long time, see. So part of the reason God sends preachers is to wake you up and snap you out of your malaise. If you're going, man, everybody, everybody, everybody has their demons they battle. None of us are perfect, amen. We all do things wrong. If you've allowed yourself to slip into that mode of Christianity that excuses what God doesn't excuse. Broad is the way that leads to hell for the many that choose the easy way. But the path that leads to heaven is straight and narrow and only a few there be that find it. I'm not bringing this up to you to make you sad or I'm doing this to call. Let's pray. Let's get it under the blood. Let's you leave out those back doors, the happiest person in North Texas, saying, my sins, though they were many, they're forgiven. They're under the blood, never to be remembered again. And that's why we give altar calls. 35 years of camouflage altar calls. Just lift that hand. God sees that hand. Nobody needs to see when Peter gave his altar call, gave his call to Christ, they didn't scan a QR code from where they were standing. They came out and joined the church in front of government that was anti-church. I'm going to call you because it will do something for you. Basically, what you do right now in receiving Christ is what you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. Say, I don't care what the rest of the crowd's doing. I come out of the crowd and stand for God. And the Bible says if you stand for, if you confess me publicly before men, I will confess you publicly before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father that's in heaven. And I've basically just been running an experiment for the last two years. Just doing everything you're not supposed to do. Long sermons, altar calls, tithes and offerings. And see if the Bible still works or not. And it's exploding in Pittsburgh. And if it explodes in the Northeast, it's, going to exp it's exploding here. Can you say amen? amen? 878 in attendance on Wednesday night. But you had, you had Rodney Howard Brown in. Still counts. Yeah, think of that. 878 in attendance for, some, for an event that was known that was going to be a Holy Ghost word event. So don't tell me Texas isn't hungry. Every head bowed, every eye closed.
Jonathan, I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm a student. I'm a senior. And I've never received Jesus Christ. Ask yourself, has there ever been a time in your life where you've publicly received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Secondly, I once did receive Jesus Christ. But I have allowed myself to slip back into sin without realizing it. But this morning, the Word of God has woke me up. And I realize I must get rid of sin. Or sin will get rid of me. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. I make up my mind. I don't care who sees me. I'm making up my mind. I'm going to serve Jesus Christ for the rest of my life with passion, with, a be- with, with reckless abandon in Jesus' name. If you fall into either of those two groups, I want to pray with you right now. If you say, Jonathan, that's me. I don't want to go out those doors pretending like everything's okay. I want to leave those doors knowing October 22nd, 2023, I stood at an altar at Ridgely Theater in Fort Worth, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. My my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I am free from sin. I'm ready for heaven. If that's you and you need to do that, I want you to put your hand up right now and wave it at me. We're going to pray together. I see you. I see you. I know there's more. I see you. Awesome. Who else before we pray? I see you. Awesome. I see you in the back. Very quickly. And if it takes you time to get up here, I understand. If you're older, I'll wait for you. Everyone that lifted a hand and meant business with God. Those of you with more boldness, come first. It'll help those that are are more timid. Come right now. We're going to pray. In Jesus' name. Come right now. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray with you. We're going to get things right with God. This is going to turn everything around. Go ahead and sing. Anybody else before we pray? Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else anywhere before we pray? All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Awesome. There's room for you. Anybody else before we pray? Lift your hands all over this room. Those of you that have come forward, I want you to pray this from your heart with me. It was so nice to see parents walk their children up. You know, I've seen parent, Christian parents, their little kid will raise their hand to get saved like at six, and they'll, they'll like talk them out of it. No, you're, no, they know. The devil doesn't wait till you're 25 to start showing you what he's got. So why make your children wait till they're old? Get them in the presence of God. Everybody that's at this altar, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. If you will believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth, for with the heart man believeth unto salvation, and with, or with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So don't mumble this or think it. Say this out loud. It carries power. Say this, Heavenly Father, I've come forward today to give you my life Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me in your blood. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Right now, I receive forgiveness by the blood of Jesus. I am saved. I am forgiven. I am clean in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your hands lifted. Let me bless you. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever has been messed up by sin and disobedience and rebellion to God in your family, in your marriage, in your finances, in your health, the God who saved you, just like he did to that man that couldn't eat, he restores you in Jesus' name. All the mess that you've been surrounded with, the Lord's going to help clean it out. Today you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Jesus' name, welcome to the family of God. Your sins are all forgiven. God doesn't remember one thing you did before this morning. You're as saved as I am.
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Those of you at the altar, lift your hands. Actually, everybody, lift your hands. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't become a pastor to do funerals, so get healed. Receive life. Receive health. Receive strength. The same blood that destroys the hold of sin destroys the yoke of sickness and disease. Be healed in Jesus' name. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet, new bloodstream, new organs, new central nervous system. In Jesus' name. That's it. They're right through you. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, with your eyes closed and your hands lifted, everybody that's at this altar, I curse every unclean addiction in Jesus' name. I curse the taste for drugs or for alcohol and the passion for drugs. I curse the taste of nicotine off your lip and tongue. In Jesus' name, be free. In Jesus' name. I thank you for it, Lord. Now, every hand lifted in this place, just begin to thank God for what he's done. Unlike that guy at that club in New Jersey, begin to thank God for what he's already done. Until you thank God for what he's done, you're not qualified to receive any more. But once you've thanked him, it opens the door for more blessing, more grace, more of his power. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name forever and ever and ever. We give you praise. Come on, let's take 30 seconds. Just lift up our voices. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are great. You are great. Tell him you love him. Lift him up. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Bless the Lord, I tell myself. And forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all my sins and heals all my disease. He ransoms my life from death. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. In Jesus' name. Say that verse with me. Say, my youth is renewed like the eagles. So along with healing, when I lay hands on you, you're going to receive that. Fresh eyesight. Fresh hearing. Fresh hips and knees. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Not just healing from sickness, youth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, in this church, you're not going to be a slave to Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson. You're going to receive the red blood of Jesus Christ, and it's going to cleanse you from all sin, all addiction, all sickness, and all disease. Amen. To my friends at the altar, welcome to the family of God. Your sins are all forgiven. Where's our altar team? Okay. Before you go back to your seat, and they're not going to hold you, this is uh, our altar team. Nice people. We vetted them. We ran background checks on them. These are good people. They're going to give you a gift from me, and I would, like you, I would like them to be the first people you meet now. So even if you've done this before, do that. And uh, if you don't have a church, please plug in here. This is the only Sunday we're here at Ridgely Theater. We're at Lifestyle Christianity, 7200 Denton Highway in Watauga, Texas, 9 a.m. next week and for the rest of the year. So please be a part of that. I would love to be your pastor for the rest of your life. Then after that, you're free to do whatever you want. Please head that way. Go ahead and help them, guys. That way, just receive a gift quickly. Give them a big hand clap. Give Jesus an even bigger hand clap. Somebody shout hallelujah. All right, be seated briefly. We're going to receive the morning tithes and offerings, and I'm going to lay hands on everybody that wants hands laid on them. Thank you, Jesus. Our envelopes are already on the seat, or they need, they need one? Oh, yeah, I'm already. Okay. Give you a second to fill that out. Thank you for your giving. 
Those of you that are watching online, thank you for your giving. RevivalToday.com, click Give Now. Do you have the ambulance slide, Mr. Rump? We extended this one week because people wanted to get involved on, in it. We're sending an ambulance to Israel, and I'm not doing it through an organization. It, so this is not giving, and everybody's taking 20% off the top. We're buying an ambulance from an ambulance store, and we're sending it uh, to Israel. That's 115000 So if you would like to give to that, you can give in that today. Bible says in Numbers 24, 9, those that bless Israel, I will bless. Up until last week, I've never done anything to bless. That's like the only thing I could find in the Bible that I haven't done yet that you're supposed to do. So I'm going to do it. We called the embassy and they said that Hamas burned a bunch of their ambulances and stole a bunch. And obviously there, there's an increase in people that need medical attention. So they said that would be a great help. So we're going to do something to actually bless the nation of Israel. Not the charismatic, we bless Israel. Doesn't necessarily help anybody. Thank you for your giving. How many of you were blessed these 21 days? Well, enjoy not knowing what to do with yourself this week. Break out some board games, take a bath, up to you. going to miss you. I've had a great three, three weeks in Texas. People are so nice here. Someone actually ran me a pie to my house. I thought that only happened on Garfield. I've lived in Pittsburgh for my whole life. I've never had anyone run me baked goods by my house. People generally don't know what they're talking about. When you go to Texas, they're going to treat you as an outsider. If you get treated like this as an outsider, it must be great being an insider. <laughs> if you're watching online and you're anywhere near the Dallas-Fort Worth area, this is Revival Today Church. We'd love to have you. If you're watching from Europe or another country, and you've always wanted to attend church here and can't get a visa, just fly to Juarez and walk across. They'll bus you right here. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Everybody's laughing, but it's true. <laughs> Come on, people waste all this money on immigration work. You're one Priceline ticket and about three-quarter mile walk away. What a great Sunday. Can't wait to hear how things went in Pittsburgh. All right. The ushers are going to come forward. Now, after they receive the offering, Brother Troy, stand up so people can see you. Brother Troy is our, I'm, I move around. He's here in Texas. He's our boots on the ground among other leaders we have, and this is a good man. So this is not a Sunday morning church. We have... We actually, uh, last week we got an office here in, in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the church. So this, I'm not trying this out. We're here. So, got a house now. I'm going to see what the laws are and how many days I have to live in it to claim Texas taxes instead of Pennsylvania taxes. <laughs> Brother Troy, after you give, is going to tell you how to line up. I'm not going to hold you here all day, but I would recommend, rather than waiting in the lobby of a restaurant, I'd recommend getting hands laid on you. And I would do it not in Sunday morning mode. I would do it with a hunger that I'm going to receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost that's going to carry me in this last hour of time. While the world's going like this, I'm going to be going from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. Amen? Amen. Don't receive the offering quite yet. Let me pray for this lady in the nice floral uh, sweater. Yeah. Step out to the side. Lift both hands to the Lord. 
He'll be the first one to receive today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for a fresh wind, fresh fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. By the way, one of the things they said in the book of Acts was, then times of refreshing will come from the Holy Spirit. A divorce takes a lot out of you. Losing a child takes a lot out of you. There's serious things people go through, and if you don't get what, you're, what I'm offering you from the Bible today, you're in for a long haul. There's no cure in the natural. But with God, God, one touch from heaven will turn everything around. How many of you can testify to that today? One touch from heaven. Hold your seeds up before the Lord, your tithe and offering. Father, I thank you for a hundredfold return. I join my faith with every giver today for a hundredfold return. I pray before this year closes out, the remaining two, two and a quarter months, that there would be land acquisition in their business, that doors would come open for employment better than they ever imagined. As they honor you in their giving, honor them and honor their house. In Jesus' name. Everybody said a good Texas amen. amen. Go ahead and receive the offering. Come up with me, Brother Troy. Oh, dang. I just got the, I just, oh yeah. New members class is today directly after service. And it's here, yes. I wish, I wish I could tell you, but I can't tell you. Can you, can you mute my mic so it doesn't go online? I designed this yesterday with the help of my team. I got so tired of reading online, everybody talking about church hurt and how they've been hurt in church. How many feel victory in this place? How many are glad you came to church today? Okay. So it says, church hurt, come get some. And then I have a knife in one hand and brass knuckles on the other fist. So if you want to wear something to the grocery store, that'll give you plenty of space in every direction. Praise God. If you don't want to wear that, I don't blame you. I'm just telling you, it's available. Somebody shout, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, stand on your feet. Brother Troy's going to give you some instruction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you everything I got. I stayed over unexpectedly. We changed venues. I don't want to just leave you here. We didn't have the ability to, to live stream and simulcast like normal. 
So before I get on the plane and go kiss my wife and daughter, I'm going to lay hands on you, and God's going to touch you today. This is going to be a turning point in your life. Normally, I love you. So normally I wouldn't do this. I just do exactly what you ask. But I want to personally thank you, and I want to speak on behalf of all the members how much we're so thankful for you, Pastor Dallas. It's an honor to serve Revival Today Church and the work that's happening here. I want to thank you, man. You don't, you don't owe me any thanks. You work hard. All the volunteers and everybody, I love you. I don't, that's why I don't do pastoral appreciation. I feel appreciated. <laughs> Somebody gave me a pecan pie for free. <laughs> what more could you ask for? Yeah. I love you. We love and you. out of that love, out of that love, we're going to pray, faith worketh by love. Amen. I'm not laying hands on anybody. I'm laying hands on you. <laughs> My Come family on. in Texas. God yeah. bless you. Come on. Hallelujah. Well, it gets interesting in this building, so everybody grab all of your belongings that's on the chairs because we actually need to move all of the chairs. So everybody, grab your stuff. Don't move because we're going to also need you to move the chairs. It'll be a lot faster that way. Some people already know they're stacking them up on the rail to the side. If you're on the side, go ahead, stack them up against the wall. If you're in the middle section, go ahead and close the chairs and stack them against the railing in the front or to the back. And then if you're in the way back, you guys seem smart enough, you're figuring it out, it looks like. I got a thumbs up in the back. Sounds great. If you're an able-bodied human, you can fold up more than one chair, help somebody else who maybe needs a hand. And then we're going to start out in the front. Looks like you guys are the most ready. We're going to have three lines. So one, and then imagine somebody's taking a nap in between you and the line in front of you. That's as much space as you're going to need. So don't line up behind people. Imagine a six-foot human is lying down in front of you. Make sure you have that much space. So if you're in the second row, think to yourself, can a six-foot human lie down in front of me? If the answer is no, take a step back. And then the third row, ask yourself the same question. If you cannot fit a six-foot human lying down, taking a nap in front of you, like your grandpa after Thanksgiving or a football game, step back, please. You guys are doing great. So make sure you're not directly behind someone, shoulder to shoulder. I know you think, oh, I don't want to walk to the back. That's the only way to leave later anyway, so you're just closer to leaving when we're done. Brother JP, I think, I don't know, if, do we need more room in that row there? Is that going to be good enough, that whole row? That whole row is going to need to move back, please. Just bring your belongings with you. Everyone else, close your eyes. Lift your hands. If you've missed any one of the meetings, you're going to receive a full download of anything that you missed over the last 21 days. Today marks the end cap to break through for you and your family in Jesus' name. Every hand lifted. Father, by the laying on of hands, I thank you for your word that said, stir up the gift that came on the inside of you when I laid my hands on you. I loose the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now think of this, the same Holy Spirit that fills you and births that passion, he doesn't have a twin brother that heals. The same power that gives you that passion to serve God heals your body, restores your mind. In Jesus' name, go ahead and sing. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If you're filled with the Spirit, begin to pray in the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's it. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. In the name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for passion. Thank you for a fire that will never go out. I dedicate this baby to the Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus, that's it. Fresh fire. Fresh fire in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for fresh fire. Thank you for fresh fire. Thank you for fresh fire. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Go right through you. Be healed. In Jesus' name. Fresh fire. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus. In Jesus' name, thank you for fresh fire. Worthy is your name. Egandianamo. Thank you. Thank you for raising up mighty men and women of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for a fire that will never go out. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Rostoni Arabo. Pandi Arabo Tia. Risto Tia. Thank you. Thank you for fire. Thank you for fire. Rondo Fresh fire. Fresh fire. In Jesus' name. Fresh fire. Fresh anointing. Never the same. Never the same. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Fresh. Fire. In Jesus' name. In the name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Jesus, you deserve the praise. What is your name? Oh, worthy. Oh, worthy. Oh, be exalted now in the heavens as you glory. Fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names, and be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names, and be exalted now in the heavens as your glory.
Well, come on, give Jesus a one more great big hand clap today. Come on, clap for the victory. Let the devil know he's in for a bad week. Hallelujah. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Well, lift your hands up. Say this from your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that because of your blood and your resurrection, I'm blessed and not cursed. I'm above and not beneath. I don't go up and down. I go from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. Now, as your pastor, I prophesy over you, the last defeat that you saw will be the last defeat you ever see. The last two and one quarter months of this year, you are ordained for exploits in Jesus' name. Many that pay rent now will soon have people pay rent to them in Jesus' name. I bless you. I bless your families. I bless your children. I bless your children's children. Anyone who came to church here today themselves, before long, your entire family will sit in the section with you. In Jesus' name. Because God already saved the worst one. So the rest is easy. Amen? New members class, I would, I would invite you to join. Even if you don't want to be a member, you get a free meal, they won't know. But I would love for you to plug into this church. We're going to give the devil a boot to the skull till Jesus comes. Give the Lord another great hand clap. Have the best week you've ever had. Go ahead and sing them out in victory.